Okay, class, uh, I'm back for the third mini lecture that I'm doing today. Um, and this one is going to be about food deserts. So we're kind of take, we're getting down to local scale. Uh, and this would be, you know, what would, for example, cities and municipalities have to do with solutions to food insecurity? And perhaps uh, the, um, the metaphor of the analysis of food deserts helps us with what, what that's, Act, those actions might be. Let me share my screen again. So starting with, so this is uh, these two mini lectures now about food deserts. The first one is going to be looking at the U.S. experience and the concept of food deserts. Uh, and then the last one for today, we'll look at food deserts um, mapping research, which has been done here in Alberta. So first, a few definitions. Um, so food desert is used as a metaphor, right? The idea of, of desert or oasis or swamp are different things. So different geographic features to make people think about, uh, kind of to make their case, which is already a framing, right? So we're framing uh, a food, a lack of good food access for relatively vulnerable people to be like uh, living in a desert. Uh, so then a food desert has been defined uh, as a populated, typically low income area with limited access to nutritious foods, um, including the access you get from supermarkets. What are the uh, attributes then of food deserts is usually it's health, it's easier to get unhealthy food than healthy food. So there's a, um, a there may be food available readily uh, but it might be less healthy food than the, the food you might get in a supermarket. Um, that people may have personal inabilities to cope with living in an area of limited food access. Uh, so um, that if everyone since can drive and has a car and, and it has easy road transport, maybe it doesn't matter that you don't live very close to the supermarket. Uh, but for some people who don't have all of those options, uh, living in a food desert is more of a problem. Um, people who are more reliant than for their access to some of these smaller retail outlets other than supermarkets may be paying higher prices and may have less selection uh, and sometimes have lower quality and or lower nutrition, nutrient content than the food available in supermarkets. Um, you have situations uh, where uh, the, the, the food outlets that do get established in an area of food desert um, might, uh, might be kind of on their own. They might have a little local monopoly um, and therefore uh, ha are able to charge higher prices. Um, they have, they're handling smaller volumes, therefore the cost per unit that they're handling is higher for them because they don't, um, they can't benefit from economies of scale that's um, having lower cost with higher volume. Uh, they have higher cost possibly because uh, of the having to rent high value retail space. They may pay more insurance, they may have higher delivery costs. So uh, this is all about food access and what does the restricted food access in your local area mean uh, in terms of your, um, your well-being. So that's a food desert, uh, a place with poor access. We also have a concept that people have used more recently, which is a food swamp, uh, an area with a high density of establishments that sell high calorie junk food and fast food. Um, so we could think about, um, you know, some of the um, some along some of our main arteries, you have, um, you know, lots of food option, outlet options, but actually relatively um, few exit options that actually have high, uh, you know, good selection of high quality, lower cost food. Um, uh, the other concept then is we've got uh, desert and swamp, right, just kind of representing these two different circumstances. Um, another one you might think about um, a food oasis. Um, where you really have great options to healthy uh, food food environments, right? So that's in a way an alternative to both 
a swamp or a desert is an oasis where really things are great um, and that uh, you've got low cost, it's healthy, it's um, it things which are culturally acceptable, they meet nutritious needs, uh, they're great, great, great place to live. So maybe you can think about, you know, deserts and swamps and oasis in, that you're aware of here in, in any, wherever you're living or, or here in Edmonton. So the analysis is why do we care about this? Uh, why do we care about deserts or swamps? Or, uh, and, and we care because of the link to people's health and other indicators of their well-being. Research in the US, and that's where most of the work has been done on food deserts, suggests that easy access to supermarkets uh, is associated with low, lower prevalence of over obesity and overweight. And we've not defined these terms in this class yet, but these are um, indicated by your body mass index, which is your weight for height, uh, at where a uh, overweight and obesity are, are measured by uh, greater than 25 BMI or greater than 30 BMI. So you can check that online to get the exact indicator and see where you where you where you fall on this. Um, places uh, that have uh, so uh, places that have easy access to convenience stores, so we might call those uh, food swamps, have higher prevalence of obesity and overweight. Um, they also people who shop at Walmart superstores, so super centers, uh, which are uh, these are massive. Um, um, stores uh, in the US tend to buy less healthy food than those that shop at regular supermarkets. So we could think about uh, those kind of shopping behaviors. So super centers might be considered to be supermarkets, but they're also you know, um, selling a variety of other things. So we, food deserts can exist in a rural area. Um, and often we think of there, there are lots of rural areas where really it's far to the nearest food outlet. Um, uh, or they can exist in an urban area. Most of the research on the health, the health costs are in urban areas where people are less likely to have good transport. Um, kind of the classic cases have been uh, identified as Baltimore and Detroit. These are places that have had um, some type of urban decay in their city centers for one reason or another. Um, uh, you know, Baltimore is a very old city, uh, does not have, has not, did not, was not very, very successful at, at uh, revitalizing its urban core. Um, and Detroit is probably an extreme case where uh, we went from having uh, heavy reliance on the auto industry to the auto industry almost drying up. Uh, people fled Detroit City. Of kind of the center of Detroit, moving into the moving out of the area, or at least into the suburbs, um, and kind of, in a way, kind of hollowing out the city center, and that's still a, a tremendous problem. Um, in uh, Detroit, for example, there's a f just a few large change, large chains, uh, controlling most supermarkets. The prices are higher in the urban areas than suburban areas. Um, uh, we've had the remaining population are, ten, are often lower income uh, and sometimes are racialized uh, as, as the situation in Detroit. Uh, so more black people remaining in the city center and more white people and other, um, uh, others moving out. Um, higher land prices, so, uh, uh, and therefore dif difficult to establish supermarkets in that kind of environment. Um, and with lower income, uh, lower purchasing power, and then perceptions is another thing. There's both, both real lower purchasing power and then perceptions that, that uh, people who are living in, in these areas have lower um, income. Um, there may be actually higher crime rates but, or it may, and or there may be perceptions of higher crime rates um, and then overt uh, and covert racism and, um, and systematic racism, which I think we would um, see, especially these days. So here is some analysis that was done a few years ago then about the food deserts in Detroit. Um, and they looked at kind of people's access to mainstream grocers uh, relative to their access to other 
types of food outlets. And the red areas here are areas that they mapped as food deserts. So you can see uh, some of them. So this is for Detroit City, and there's a greater metropolitan area that Detroit City is the center of. Um, you can see this concentration of food deserts in the downtown core, um, you know, near the Lake Michigan, um, and some in the scattered suburbs further out, but this kind of concentration uh, in of places where there was a high proportion of ex, you know, good, easy access to non-supermarkets and poor access to supermarkets. And that's how they have just find this out of balance um, score. So where were people eat, uh, buying their food? Uh, and this is um, where people were, um, especially those who received support from the government, from the supplemental nutrition assistance program or at that point called food stamps or SNAP, now called SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Where were they redeeming their food stamps uh, for food? And you can see the school grocers and supermarkets is relatively small. Uh, the liquor and party stores was the biggest single location and gas station stores and convenience stores. And then the range of other things like pharmacies and convenience stores and dollar stores uh, as being places where people are, are shopping who, who are, have been defined of, as food insecure and therefore um, eligible for receiving this, uh, the SNAP um, vouchers. So shocking compared to the, what you told me, uh, you told us about your shopping, food shopping behaviors, which is mostly grocery stores. So one, I found this study from 2015, kind of doing a reassessment of the food um, uh, desert story for Baltimore that I think is interesting. Um, after this kind of publicized publication and, uh, and greater publicity about the food desert problem, uh, the United States Department of Agriculture at, with urging from, the, uh, from, particularly from Michelle Obama who became their Kind of ambassador really wanted to tackle this problem of food deserts in the U.S. Um, Detroit, sort of a, a bad case, they really wanted to deal with. Um, they gave tax breaks for big supermarket chains to establish or re-establish operations in metropolitan Detroit. Um, and uh, what they uh, Taylor and Ard found was that there were very large um, investments made. Uh, with possibly very little return. So um, two big supermarket chains established operations, but it's questionable whether how durable those will be if the, if the kind of base conditions for supermarkets don't really exist there is, is the answer for having no supermarkets to build supermarkets, or as proposed by Taylor and Ard or, and many other common commentaries about Detroit, is actually different, is actually to uh, uh, kind of build with the food providers who are there, have them do a better job of getting uh, affordable and nutritious food to people. Um, they found, Taylor and Nard found that there was a, a wide variety of community groups, uh, the municipal government itself, the, the, that is the city of Detroit municipal government, um, and independent grocers have uh, uh, for, uh, responded in a variety of ways to the food desert problems. Um, so, uh, uh, food, urban food initiatives have been established on vacant land. There's large amounts of vacant land um, in the city as with this hollowing out and depopulation that occurred. There's more and more and more urban food initiatives. People, they, um, I think they found that 6% of all the food outlets were actually associated with urban agriculture. Uh, green, having green grocery programs so that people who were running corner grocery stores were supported to have better access to uh, nutritious, healthy food uh, from the hinterland uh, and also to, su to support them in their, um, their marketing um, and emergency food assistance and, and uh, soup kitchen type organizations were very active. So there has been a response and, and I think it's an interesting case to think about with food deserts, again, is uh, food deserts, if we're defining as lack of grocery stores, it implies 
that the solution is to have grocery stores um, at, at, to respond to that, but perhaps there, there are other things which need to be done. I'm going to end this mini lecture now here uh, and then come back and talk about the situation uh, here in Alberta. So I'm going to stop sharing and stop recording. <laughs>